Good evening. Welcome to the October 2nd, 2023 meeting of the Stillwater City Council. At this time, I will call the meeting to order and I'll ask that you all stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. We've got a couple of fun proclamations tonight, good proclamations tonight. If you saw the power truck out in the street, uh, that's because it's getting ready to be Public Power Week. It is Public Power Week. So I'll read our Public Power Week proclamation, and then I'm not sure who's here. Lauren is going to come up and let us know a little bit more about public power. Whereas the residents of Stillwater, Oklahoma, place value on local control of community services and have chosen to operate a community-owned electric utility, and as customers and owners of this electric utility, we have a voice in utility operations and policies. And whereas Stillwater Electric Utility provides homes, businesses, social services, health care, and local government agencies with reliable, efficient, cost-effective electricity, employing sound business practices designed to ensure the best possible service at competitive rates, and whereas Stillwater Electric Utility is a valuable community asset that contributes to the well-being of local residents through financial support of the general government, including public safety, transportation, parks, library, and recreation, and whereas Stillwater Electric Utility is a dependable and trustworthy institution whose local operation provides many consumer protections and continues to make the, the community a better place to live and work and contributes to protecting the global environment, and whereas the Stillwater Electric Utility will continue to work to bring low-cost, safe, reliable electricity to community homes and businesses, just as it has since 1901 when the utility was created to serve all Stillwater residents. And whereas the Stillwater community joins with more than 2,000 other public power systems in the United States in celebration of public power. Now therefore, I, William Joyce, Mayor of the City of Stillwater, do hereby proclaim the week of October 1st through 7th, 2023, as Public Power Week to recognize Stillwater Electric Utility for its contributions to the community and the benefits of public power. Good evening, Councilors. Lauren Smith, Electric Utility Director. Um, I always, it always, uh, I find it very fascinating when I hear 1901, you know, six years before statehood, we were providing electricity to our citizens. Uh, but we couldn't do it without you and your support. We greatly appreciate that. And we also couldn't do it without uh, the expert Stillwater Electric Utility team that works day and night to keep our, our city electrified. So thank you very much. Thank you guys for all you do. All right, one of our favorite visitors is here. Sparky's here to help us recognize Stillwater Fire Prevention Week, which is actually next week, but I'll go ahead and read this proclamation and then we'll hear a little bit more about fire prevention. Whereas the city of Stillwater is committed to ensuring the safety and security of all residents and visitors, and whereas fire is a serious public safety concern, both locally and nationally, and homes are the locations where people are at greatest risk. And whereas home fires have caused 2,580 civilian deaths in the United States in 2020, according to the National Fire Protection Association, and fire departments in the United States responded to 356,000 home fires. And whereas residents who have planned and practiced a home fire escape plan are more prepared and will therefore be more likely to survive a fire. And whereas Stillwater residents should make sure their smoke and carbon monoxide alarms meet the needs of all their family members, including those with sensory or physical disabilities. And whereas Stillwater first responders are dedicated to reducing the occurrence of home fires and home fire injuries through prevention and protection education. And whereas the 2023 Fire Prevention Week serves to remind residents of, its imp of the importance of having a home fire safety escape plan. 
Now, therefore, I, William Joyce, mayor of, the, mayor of Stillwater, Oklahoma, do hereby proclaim the week of October 8th through 14th, 2023, as Fire Prevention Week, and I urge all the people of Stillwater to plan and practice a home fire escape and support public safety activities of Stillwater Fire and Emergency Services. Good evening, Council. Dustin Portman, Deputy Fire Marshal for Stillwater Fire Department. Uh, thank you guys for supporting this Fire Prevention Week. Well, this is something we've done in Stillwater for such a long time. So, uh, coming up next week, we'll be doing presentations in all six Stillwater Elementary Schools. We'll be reaching over 3,000 elementary age students with this good message about this year's about uh, cooking safety and about how many fires start in homes due to unintended cooking. And a lot of times, that's kids that are home unattended, you know, before parents come home from school. So this is a, a great outreach to the school, uh, the citizens of Stillwater through the through the kids, and we can't do it without your support. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. I feel like we've been doing this long enough that we should have a maybe a little better mask for Sparky that you can see out of. It would be helpful. All right. Uh, at this time, we have kind of a weird uh, item on the consent docket tonight. So what I'm going to do is actually move that we recess the city council meeting uh, prior to item four. We have a motion and a second to recess city council. Please vote. We vote a five to zero. The city council is now in recess, and I am going to move forward to call the a special meeting of the Stillwater Public Works Authority to order. This is one of our very seldom used authorities, but uh, we have a, an easement issue on the consent docket under the special meeting for the Public Works Authority. So, trustees, uh, questions, comments, or motion on the consent docket? I move to approve consent. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent docket. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, that item is approved. The consent docket's approved. Any reports from the officers of the board? That's all we have on the agenda for the Stillwater Public Works Authority. So is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn Stillwater Public Works. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, the Stillwater Public Works Authority meeting is now adjourned. At this time, I will reconvene the Stillwater City Council meeting at item four on the agenda, which is our consent docket. Councilors, questions, comments, motions on the consent docket? Motion to approve consent docket. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve consent. Please vote. Sorry, I'm. With a vote of five to zero, the consent docket is approved. Public comment on items not scheduled for public hearings. I don't think we have anything for this meeting, correct? Okay. So we'll move to our public hearings. Public uh, item number 7A is public hearing to receive comment regarding a request from Stewart Housing Development Corp for a map amendment to rezone property addressed as 716 West 11th Avenue from small lot single family residential to two family multifamily, CC-23-151. Kimberly, we have good notice. Yes, All right, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Jacqueline Porter, City Planner, presenting on behalf of the Planning Department. The first item, as mentioned, is a map amendment request by the Stillwater Housing Development Corp to rezone the property address of 716 West 11th Avenue from small lot single family residential to two family and multifamily residential to allow for multiple small single family residential units. 
Here's an area map of the subject property at the intersection of South Ramsey Street and West 11th Avenue. The subject property is located north of Southern Woods Park and the associated parking is located to the west of the property. Here's Street View, looking uh, northeast from the intersection of South Ramsey and 11th Avenue. The current zoning of the property is RSS with similar zoning adjacent, adjacent to the north and the east and public is to the west and south. RTM is in the vicinity on the next block to the north. The future land use map projects the desired use of the property to be low density at the time of the comprehensive plan was adopted. Stillwater Housing Development Corp is proposing a eight small one bedroom conventional single family homes. The rezoning would allow for the multi-family structures, multiple family structures on the subject property. The applicant has also requested for a specific use permit to allow for conventional single family homes in the proposed zone district. Roger Gose and Tony um, Royals is here on behalf of Stillwater Housing Authority. Are there any questions for staff at this time? Councilors, any questions? This time I will open the public hearing. We do have Roger Ghost signed up to speak on the item. I signed up Roger Ghost. Uh, 1120 East Connell, just in case Tony didn't make it, so I don't want to oh, steal okay. her thunder if she's got anything to say, but um, we've uh, got this piece of land we need to do something with, and uh, we'd like to develop some housing in there that uh, can be good put to good use for more like workforce affordable type housing. Are there any questions? Counselors? Thank you, sir. Thank you. I don't have a sign up for Tony, but if you have comments or you you're not required to. <laughs> I've never done this before. Uh, Tony Broyles. Um, I don't live in Stillwater, so do I have to say my address? You, you're the. I'm the director, director. with the Stillwater Housing yeah, Authority, okay. and also Stillwater Housing Development Corporation. Um, through the 26 years that I've been there, just watching the families that have gone through housing and seeing the need that's there, uh, one bedrooms is desperately needed. And I have you know, four or five different agencies that have already contacted me about using those houses specifically for different programs that they have. And I just think it's a wonderful program. Sounds Thank good. you. Thank you so much. I don't have anyone else signed up to speak on the item. Was anybody else here for it? I'll go ahead and close the public hearing. Jacqueline, what is the Planning Commission recommendation on? Planning Commission recommended approval with a vote of five to zero. Counselors, any further questions or action on the item? I move to approve the Planning Commission recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the Planning Commission's recommendation. Please vote. Approved with the vote of five to zero. Item 7B received public comment regarding a request for a specific use permit for property located at 716 West 11th Avenue for construction of eight small lot single family residential units. CC 23 152. Do we have good notice on this item? All right, thank you. This is a specific use permit, is in conjunction with the previous approved map amendment request by the Stillwater Housing Development Court. This specific use permit is to allow conventional single family homes in RTM zoning districts for the property address of 716 West 11th Avenue. Just to recap, here is the aerial view of the subject property it is located at the intersection of South Ramsey and 11th Avenue with Southern Woods Park located to the south. Here's the zoning map of the area. Small lot single family is located to the north and the east with public located to the south and west. This is a specific use permit request is to allow for single family homes in an RTM zoning district. Stillwater Housing Development Corp is proposing eight small 
one bedroom homes. The MAP amendment allowed for multiple structures. This SCP would allow for single family dwellings on the subject site. In the, in the same section of all this, section 23139E4 also states that it allows for more than one principal residential structure in an RTM. Roger and Tony are here on behalf of Stillwater Housing Authority. Are there any questions for staff? Councilors? Thank you, Jacqueline. Yep. This time I'll open the public hearing. Uh, is there anybody, Roger? I've got one clarification. Uh, on, the, on the title that you read, it says single lots or small lots. Eight small lots, single family residents. Yeah, they're not small lots. It's all one, one lot. One lot. That's why we had to go RTM and SGP. So we're not Understood. subdividing it. It's one lot with eight small houses. Yeah, and, and Jack, Jackie's report was right. It's just the way it was printed there. Thank you. Just a typo. Anyone else here that was planning to speak on this item? This time I'll close the public hearing. Counselors, questions? Uh, I guess I'll ask just since he brought that up. Ms. Carnley, any issue with the, that word being erroneously in the title? I'm reviewing it now, but no, I don't think there's any issue. The, um, you may continue. Thank you. Counselors, questions? Com oh, actually, Jacqueline, did the uh, Planning Commission have a recommendation on this item? They sure did. Planning Commission recommend approval of five to zero. Thank you. Counselors? Motion to accept Planning, planning Commission's recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the Planning Commission's recommendation. Please vote. It's approved with a vote of five to zero. Thanks, Jacqueline. Thank you. Uh, just as an aside, I think it's great that we've got this creative uh, solution that uh, the Housing Authority is um, pursuing, and I'm excited to see uh, what can be done there. We definitely do. We need uh, affordable housing in this community, and so it's, it's great that uh, this is happening. Hopefully something we'll see more of. So thank you for your work. Item 7C. Receive public comment regarding a request for a specific use permit to use property addressed at 211 North Perkins Road, Suite 10 as a medical marijuana dispensary. CC-23-157. Did we have good notice on this item? Yes, we do. Ms. Porter. All right. Thank you. As mentioned, this next item is a request for a specific use permit to operate a medical marijuana dispensary at 211 North Perkins, Suite number 10, zoned as CS. Here's an area map of the subject property. It is located on the east side of North Perkins between East Hall of Fame and East Virginia Avenue. The subject property is part of the Rosewood Hill Shopping, Shopping Center. Walmart is located to the east. Raisin Canes and Chick-fil-A are to the north. Salaski's and Del Taco is to the west. Is there a reason you're showing the fast food restaurants around the medical <laughs> marijuana dispensary? Everybody, this is where the food is. No. <laughs> Just relevant points of interest? Yes, gotcha. yes. <laughs> All right, so the subject property is zoned commercial shopping with similar zoning surrounding the property except to the west. It is zoned commercial general. The subject property was previously a medical marijuana dispensary. The previous owner so sold the license and triggering for a new specific use permit to operate. Are there any questions for staff? Counselors? I don't think we have any questions. I'll go ahead and open a public hearing. I don't have anyone signed up to speak on this item. So I uh, will close the public hearing. Is there a recommendation? Yes, Planning Commission recommended approval with a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Counselors? Motion to accept Planning Commission's recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept the Planning Commission's recommendation. Please vote. <coughs> that item passes with a vote of four to one. No vote from Councillor Hardin. All right, that takes us to item 7D. Receive public comment regarding a request for a text amendment to the Land Development Code, Chapter 23, Land Development Code, Article 6, Use Classifications, Division 1, Generally, Section 23-121, Exemptions, Setback for Fences, etc., Projections into yards with the provisions for the land development code within the provisions of the land development code. Ms. Porter. All right, thank you. My final item I'm presenting tonight is a text amendment 
as Mayor Joyce had already announced. We do have good notice. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, this item was originally developed by staff to address a reoccurring cases presented to the Board of Adjustment in relation to the location and the height limitations of fences in the secondary front yard for corner lot properties. Here is some statistics over the past few years of variance requests for fences locations on corner lots. 70, 15 of the 75 requests have been for fences on corner lots. That's approximately 20%. And I'll let you kind of see that the other ones are the six. Five. We only had two so far this year. Here's the current section of code. This text amendment has been in the works for almost a year. City staff, legal, building relations committee, and planning commission have all contributed to the draft of this, tax, this text amendment to help simplify and, and clarify the existing text. Here is the proposed. The major changes between the current and proposed is the changes of the word exempt in the table to, to say allow and to clarify it as yards instead of setbacks in this table. In, B, in B1, the secondary front yard is defined and states a fence, hedge, or visual barrier four to eight feet in height may extend within five feet of the secondary front yard of the corner lot in a residentially zoned district. Uh, are there any questions for staff? I do have examples if you would like to clarification of what's being presented to the BOA. I'd like to see examples. <laughs> okay, so here's one of our ones that we had this year. As you can see, there's a corner lot. There's Dottie in Maple. They are wanting to extend into the front yard since they have no rear yard. So they wanted to go ahead and make it flush up to the blue line over to the west is the fence and then the property line is the red covered with it's purple now because they put the blue over it but that's the fence along that property line as well and they're that's projecting into their secondary frontage and so they clarified that they're not going to affect the site triangle on the site plan and so this is one case Here's another so, one. So back to that one. They're going to extend the fence on the red line. Is that what I'm mm -hmm. understanding? Okay, thank yes. you. Yes. And here's another one that's along Washington and Will, Will Rogers. This is over by the elementary school. Um, it's another similar case. They are wanting to extend the fence towards Washington and make it flush with the attached garage there on the east side of the house just to make a larger lot if they didn't it would have been flush along the east side of the attached garage cutting it off quite fairly a lot of the backyard that they would use for their dog those are the only two examples okay thank you <laughs> so the the change doesn't I mean in practice we've been allowing this when they've applied for, for mm -hmm. um, but this is still protecting the sight lines for traffic we're not correct we're taking into consideration the, this, the fact that the site triangle yeah. section still applies in any time and this is specifically for residential districts what in our code we said residential because once it comes to commercials there's usually your alleys and such that we have concerns with the site triangles with heavier vehicles um, but it also we state within five feet of that of the property line so they're not going all the way to the property in line yeah. as well for those that we don't we haven't gotten that dedication of that extra right-of-way okay. all right counselors further questions if I'm not mistaken, I sat on the Board of Adjustment, and if I'm not mistaken, the issue was that on corner properties, the way the old code is written, they had two front yards, and Correct. that required setback for both front yards. And Correct. this is creating a front yard and a secondary front yard, so we don't have quite the same issue. Correct. Okay. Anything further for staff, counselors? This time I'll open the public hearing. I don't have anyone signed up. Was anyone here planning to speak on this item? I'll go ahead and close the public hearing.
Ms. Porter, was there a recommendation from the Planning Commission on this? Yes, Planning Commission recommended approval with a vote of five to zero. Thank you. Councilors? I move to accept the Planning Commission recommendation. Second. With a motion and a second to approve the Planning Commission recommendation, please vote. With a vote of five to zero, that item is approved. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jacqueline. Item 8, General Orders. 8A is consider selection of Lippert Brothers as construction manager at risk to provide services for the remaining design, bidding, and construction of the new terminal building at Stillwater Regional Airport. And Kelly Reed is here to tell us about this item. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. <coughs> so um, just a little update on our terminal project. Um, the, as you know, the Stillwater Regional Airport terminal is under design. We're currently at 50% design for a new terminal project. Um, it's a 31,300 square foot terminal. Uh, we plan to be at 100% design early next year and then breaking ground um, spring of 2024, opening anticipated in 2026. So the, um, the um, construction delivery method that we've chosen to select is the construction manager at risk delivery method. Uh, this method was used with great success with our terminal improvements in 2015, 2016. Um, and the FAA did approve this method for the terminal project. Uh, it essentially allows the project to stay on budget, on schedule, and provides um, complex um, support of the project. So we, uh, we opened bidding to um, construction managers throughout the state. Uh, we had six companies sub uh, submit a proposal. Um, the highest four were interviewed in person on September 21st, and the highest ranking of those was Lippert Brothers. Uh, the CMAR services will be funded through FAA funds for the terminal construction project as well as a city match. Any questions on the CMAR? Councilors, any questions? It seems like it was a pretty close vote or pretty close scoring between the, the um, companies, but um, have we used Lipper? before on these projects? We have. They um, supported the terminal improvements in 2015, 2016, and they also supported the OSU Flight Center yeah. development uh, that completed last year. So they know their way around out there. They do. That's good. What's your recommendation for us? Our recommendation is to approve the Lippert Brothers as the CMR for the terminal project. And the airport director would also like to authorize the sit interim city manager to sign the CMR agreement once finalized. All right. Councilors, further questions or action on the item? Motion to accept, accept staff recommendations. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept the recommendation. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, that item is approved. Looking forward to that project kicking off. Assuming we find all the rest of the money. Item 8B, Presentation on Energy Savings Project Process. Mr. Moore. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, back on August 21st, Council requested that staff return with an impl implementation plan um, for some much needed maintenance projects that could reduce energy in the City of Stillwater for our buildings and infrastructure. These projects were identified in the energy audit that was performed during FY23. Um, the directors for these departments that oversee these identified areas of our infrastructure uh, met with city management to prioritize the energy savings projects and develop plans for staging in the implementation with available funding. Um, city management met with members of the Renewable Energy Task Force to discuss the importance of getting these projects implemented here in Stillwater. In, a, in an effort to accomplish this objective, um, city management staff will meet three times a year, every four months um, with the, the task force to share updates on the progress of projects and to share other actions the city has taken to, on reducing energy. Um, we are excited to kick off this new energy savings pr process um, this evening with the project identified to have the highest percent of energy savings, which was the LED uh, light project. Um, with the following budget amendment and bid award on the SUA agenda, we are taking a large step in converting the city st of Stillwater infrastructure and municipal buildings to 100% LED lights, which is really exciting. Um, the implementation of these energy savings projects will have a positive impact on our community as these are much needed maintenance projects. Um, 
that need to be completed, but also that the, most importantly that the cost to, to implement them will be offset in the energy savings that will that they will produce. So, um, city staff is excited to work with this the renewable energy task force moving forward and to see that these projects get implemented and there's a um, you know just a continued awareness and the importance of finding ways throughout our city and our organization uh, to reduce energy consumption. So it's a it's a big win on different levels. Um, that's kind of an overview of the process. Happy to take any suggestions or answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Brady. Counselors, questions? I do have a question. So is this capital and labor for this? Is there labor involved yes. in this? Yes, the bids that we got for the um, the LED municipal building lighting project included labor, included okay. us hiring it out. And yep. the chillers also? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. And the warranties that come along with it. Have we followed up on the, I know there's a state program for um, retrofitting lights. It's supposed to open soon. Yes. Yep. I have a note to mention that in our budget memo. It's the next okay. item. But yes, that is uh, part of the Oklahoma Department of Commerce grant program that is for municipal LED light upgrades. And so we are pursuing those grants. If I'm not mistaken, there's also provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act that would allow for the city to as a non-tax entity um, to still apply for tax incentives that would allow us to get direct payments back for projects that are um, providing for uh, energy efficiency. So something else for us to maybe look at as okay. well. Excellent. Yep, we will definitely dive into that. Thank you. Do we have timelines for when we think these initial projects will get? We're kicking, yeah, we're excited to kick them off right away. I know the the, bid award that you'll be seeing on SUA that this evening is for um, the first year of a two-year project. Lauren will clarify, I believe it's 2,200 lights in one year will do, and that's what we're awarding tonight for um, all of the LED street lights. And we're also working on parks, um, couch park LED light conversions that uh, will really have a great impact on our community. And it's, yeah, there's, there, it's kind of exciting to see where we can go with this. Excellent. That's awesome. Yeah, and I want to say to thank you to the Renewable Energy Task Force members that are in the audience tonight, and they've been a great partner on this. Well, I appreciate the fact that you guys have been able to move forward relatively quickly. We had hoped for a plan that uh, was gonna was gonna move pretty fast, so it's it's good to see that we've been able to kind of get this ready to go and at least kicked off uh, relatively quickly and get get moving. We're not gonna sit on our our heels and wait for this one. Yes, appreciate sir. the update yep all right so that takes us to item 8c which is no i'm sorry yeah mm -hmm. 8c mm -hmm. so uh, consider approval of a budget amendment appropriating expenditure of six hundred thousand dollars for the city hall chiller replacement and five hundred thousand dollars for the conversion of indoor city facility lighting that's correct so this yep the first line of the budget amendment that was attached to the agenda is the six hundred thousand to um, replace uh, our chillers here at City Hall that are often failing with two energy efficient chillers and uh, have those installed and the warranties that come along with them. And then the second line of the budget amendment is for the 500,000 uh, set aside to cover the municipal buildings LED project. And again, we're going to be going after those grants. And so hopefully if we can get some of those grants awarded, we will be able to uh, save some of that funding, which would be excellent. Yeah, I don't get way into the weeds, but about how, what, what is the warranty on those chillers? Is it X number of years? Is it? I'll have to come back with the exact, okay. but I remember uh, the quotes that we got were carrier units that had, you know, their typical commercial warranty. Okay. And this is us moving the budget over. We'll do a bid at some point for the actual chillers. We yes. don't have the, that, the, the we just want to that, Yes, sir. Okay. This, Tonight, we just wanted to go ahead and do those budget amendments as showing the community and uh, the Renewable Energy Task Force that we are getting this started. Okay. Where's the money coming from? This is from our capital uh, fund balance. Okay. Yep. Sounds like what it's supposed to be used for. Yep. Counselors, questions on the budget amendment? Action on the item. I move to approve staff recommendation. We have a motion and a second to approve the budget amendment. Please vote.
approved with a vote of five to zero. Excited to see those projects get underway. Resolutions is item nine on the agenda. Item 9A is resolution CC-2023-33, a resolution acknowledging City Council authorization and approval for the submission of an application for fiscal year 2024 bipartisan infrastructure law airport terminal program funds administered by the Federal Aviation Administration for airport infrastructure improvements at Soda Regional Airport and approving the associated budget amendments for the required sponsor match. Ms. Reed, give us just a quick overview of what that's Sure thing. So uh, council has previously approved uh, bipartisan infrastructure law funds for the airport for the design of the terminal and now we're moving into uh, the funding plan for uh, construction of the terminal. So it's a complex project. Um, we're coming in just over 24,700,000 um, in entirety for the construction of the terminal and that includes um, terminal parking and terminal parking access roads. Um, so it's a complex project. Uh, we work with the FAA and we've worked with them for several years on a capital improvement plan for the terminal. Um, so it's a multi-year phased approach, but the piece that we're coming to you tonight on is the um, just over $6 million um, grant that we intend to apply for with the FAA under the BIL, and that's the airport terminal program funds. It's a highly competitive program for airport terminal renovations um, because we have a very aged facility from uh, 1952. It's undersized. Um, it doesn't support uh, development of any additional air carriers or any larger aircraft than we currently accommodate and we're at capacity with the increase in air service from American Airlines uh, last year so we're very well posed with our air service and the growth in air service um, we meet all of the um, safety needs um, infrastructure needs that this grant is um, applying for or that we apply for through this grant and we've also been working with local state legislators to put together um, letters of interest to show the support that we've garnered for this project. So we've got um, Senator Mullen, Senator Lankford, um, several members from OSU, uh, congressmen, state senators um, supporting our project and offering written letters of support. And we will submit this um, application for this grant uh, October 16th. Excellent. Kelly, is the match any different for the BIL grants as opposed to the more traditional FAA grants that we may have been used to before? It depends on the type of funding. Um, sometimes it's 5%, sometimes it's 10%. Um, for this specific grant, it's 5%, but for the terminal project in entirety, our match is 19.32%. So higher than a typical FAA funded project because we have uh, revenue spaces for the airlines and TSA in the in the facility as well as spaces that won't be publicly used like um, airport operations and security offices. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm always happy to go ask for our tax money to come back here. So uh, I'm, I'm excited we're making this application. Hopefully we'll, we'll get those grants. So, Councilors, further questions or an action on the resolution? Motion to approve resolution number CC-2023-33. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the resolution. Please vote. Resolution CC-2023-33 is adopted with a vote of five to zero. Thank, Thank you, you, Kelly. Item 9B is resolution CC-2023-34, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Stillwater amending resolution CC-2018-24, approving the formula for determining the sales and use tax increment attributable to or generated by the Hotel Conference Center in increment district number three, City of Stillwater, to be paid into an apportionment fund for the payment of authorized project costs and authorizing submission of an application for state matching payments pursuant to the Oklahoma Local Development and Enterprise Zone Incentive Leverage Act. Mr. Moore? Yes, so this is related to the hotel uh, conference center project and this was submitted to us um, by our attorneys with the Center for Economic Development Law. This is part of the um, Oklahoma Leverage Act that we applied for again <laughs> to get some of more of our tax dollars put back into Stillwater. Um, this is a way that through the Leverage Act, they can match the taxes that we, the sales tax incentives that we attach to the project through the project plan or to the, through the redevelopment agreement. Um, and those can be matched by the state and be committed to the project and to the city for future investment. Fantastic. Counselors, any questions? Is there action on the resolution? Motion to adopt resolution CC-2023-34. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. 
Resolution CC-23-34 is adopted with a vote of 5 to 0. Item 9C is Resolution CC-2023-35, a resolution of the Stillwater City Council. As a recipient of financial assistance from the Department of Homeland Security, establishing civil rights policies to meet existing requirements under civil rights law and regulations relating to non-discrimination and non-discriminatory use of federal funds. Shelley, do you uh, have anything to further explain that? It seems fairly self-explanatory. Counselors, any questions on this resolution? Motion to adopt resolution CC-2023-35. Second. We have a motion and a second on the resolution. Please vote. With a vote of 5 to 0, resolution CC-2023-35 is adopted. Item 10 is ordinances. On first read, we have ordinance 3526, an ordinance amending Stillwater City Code by amending Chapter 23, Land Development Code, Article 6, Land Use Classifications, Division 1, Generally, Section 23-121, Exemptions, Setbacks for Fences, etc., projections into yards, repealing all ordinances to the contrary, and providing for severability. This is ordinance related to the fence item we approved earlier. Questions, comments, or action on the ordinance? I move to advance ordinance 3526 to second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to advance the ordinance. Please vote. We vote a five to zero. Ordinance 3526 is advanced to second reading. Reports from the officers and the boards. Ms. Carnley. Nothing to report. Thank you. Mr. Moore. Yes. As, excuse me. Um, as we'll have our, uh, in the, during our SUA agenda, we'll have our water and wastewater uh, presentation, utility rate study presentation. And in last meeting, we had our electric uh, utility rate study. We want to inform the community that we'll be having town halls to discuss um, the <laughs> utility rates. And we're gonna have that in person here at City Hall and as well as online via Zoom. And those dates are October 10th and October 12th. So October 10th will be the electric town hall and October 12th will be the, the water town hall. Um, we're excited to hear back feedback from our customers and answering questions that they have. Um, just rem remember that um, City Council meetings and study sessions are available on the City of Stillwater YouTube and uh, meetings are replayed on our municipal channel AT&T UVerse 99 or Optimum 14. That's a, those are really good opportunities if you're interested in the rate studies and the electric rate, utility rates in general in Stillwater. I would really encourage you, one, to watch the electric rate study from last week that we talked about. Tonight's meeting we'll talk about water. Those are on YouTube. I've shared those links with people already. Mm -hmm. to make sure they actually see what we talked about. Uh, and then those town halls will be will be great. So uh, really encourage anybody who's who has interest or concern about utility rates to take part in all of those opportunities. Vice Mayor Jaleski. Yes, on Saturday, October 21st, the city's watershed quality department will have its biannual household hazardous waste collection event. The event will be from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. at the Convenience Collection Center located at 807 South Perkins Road. During this event, residents are encouraged to drop off any household pollutants for free. Accepted items include oil-based paints, pesticides, herbicides, household cleaning products, pool chemicals, unused pharmaceuticals, and more. The Convenience Collection Center will still accept regular trash and recycling that day. However, trailers and commercial waste are not allowed. Yard waste will be accepted after 1 p.m. This event is for residents and a utility bill may be requested as proof. For a full list of acceptable items, go to stillwaterok.gov or call 405-533-8458. That new address is still getting <laughs> still me. Still tripping you up. <laughs> I get it. Councilor Hawkins. The Stillwater Police Department would love for you to join them for their annual Coffee with a Cop this Wednesday, October 4th from 10 to 11 a.m. at Roundhouse Bakery. Fabulous location on um, 108 East 10th Avenue. Come out for a cup of coffee, have your questions answered, and get to know the officers in your neighborhood. Also, please know that our splash pads located in Boomer Lake Park and Southern Woods will be closed for the season beginning Monday, October 9th. Big thanks to our parks and community resources staff for their efforts to keep us cooled off, cooled off this summer. Thank you, Counselor. Counselor Clark. 
Please save the date and plan to join us for the Stillwater Fire Department wet down ceremony on Friday, October 13th, beginning at 10 a.m. at Fire Station Number 1, which is at 1510 South Main Street. This national traditional ceremony is a way for firefighters to honor their history and show their commitment to serving the community. The event will be for two new apparatuses. One will be housed at Station 3, the other at Station 4. If you're unable to attend, please join the live stream on the Stillwater Fire Department Facebook page. If you haven't seen those new trucks, they are cool. Yes. They are really, I love the, the design scheme on them. I'm there really, was a wonderful really picture of them in front of Lambeau Field. I know, yeah, they came from up, uh, up north. Says the Packer they? fan. <laughs> so. Councilor Harden. Yes, it is Public Power Week, October 1st through 7th. This year's focus is community powered. Stillwater Electric Utility is building for the future to ensure reliable, affordable, sustainable, and customer-focused service for many years to come. That means we're working hand-in-hand -hand with customers to make sure our utility reflects their long-term goals and needs in those of our communities. We greatly appreciate our staff members who serve in the Stillwater Utility Department. They go above and beyond every day to keep the lights on and so much more. So for more, for more information go about Public Power Week, go to publicpower.org. That's one of the easiest URLs I've seen in this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's publicpower.org. Thank you. Uh, I will remind you that it's OSU football season, although some of you may want to forget. <laughs> Please consider taking advantage of the free park and ride shuttle service. It's going to get better. It's, we're, we're, yeah. it's, it says the alarm. We're going up. Let's go. It's getting better. Optimism. Take advantage of the free park and ride shuttle service. City of Stillwater and Oklahoma State University Athletics offer free parking and shuttle service from downtown Stillwater. The shuttle runs every 30 minutes before and after the game, beginning three hours before the game and runs throughout the post game. We have more than 500 free parking spots available downtown Stillwater. The pickup and drop off location for the shuttle is at 7th Avenue and Lewis Street. And save some money on parking, beat the rush, park downtown, and go visit uh, all the cool coffee shops and shops and restaurants and bars in downtown Stillwater before the game. Cowboys kick off this weekend or this week on Friday night. It's a Friday evening game, Friday, October 6th. Kickoff is at 6:30 and you will be able to take advantage of the park and ride service on Friday. Anything further, counselors? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn the city council meeting. Please vote. With the vote of five to zero, five to zero, the store city council meeting is now adjourned. At this time, I will call to order the Stillwater Utilities Authority meeting for October 2nd, 2023. We have one item on the consent docket, trustees. Motion to approve consent docket. Second. Motion and a second, please vote. Consent docket's approved with the vote of five to zero. Public comment on items not scheduled for public hearing. We do have one person signed up to provide public comment. That is Mr. Robert Sitton. There you are. Thank you, counselors, for welcoming me, or that I'm glad that I can come speak. I'm Robert Sitton, uh, 5717 West Indian the Lane, uh, out rurally of Stillwater. And I am your uh, Rural Water Advisory Chairman. So I'm kind of here to speak a little bit of thanking you all for taking on the Yost Lake pump upgrade last week in the special sessions. We uh, very much appreciate that. And then the next thing we kind of need to talk about is this water report that's coming to you tonight. And on that report, they have left out some of the clauses and agreements that was put in forth back in 2006. And it's been on every single water report forward from 2010. So me reading through this through, through this report, it's been left out and that agreement is stated in the proposal of the consideration for to receive us into Stillwater and it reads existing customers of the Corp will be guaranteed water service by the city and we'd be charged the same rates for water as residents of the city 
So that's one of the clauses that need to be put in that has been left out. And I can show you where the previous studies, that was back in 2010, and they had it in there on every single line. This report that you're receiving tonight, they did not do the research to include any of that. So just remember whatever numbers that, you, that they're presenting to you are skewed because they've got a different proposal than what's supposed to be in there. That's all I have. Appreciate Thank you. Time. Thanks for being here, Mr. Sitton. All right. Well, that will take us to the main item on this agenda, which is item 5A, presentation and discussion of water, wastewater, rural water rate study results and recommendations. That is a lot of ours. Dana Maddox is here to present this item. Good evening, Dana Maddox, Utility and Billing Services Director. So in October of 2022, the trustees approved staff to enter into a water and wastewater cost of service and rate design agreement with new gen strategies and solutions. Our internal team has been working with Dave Yonke to complete the study. As you saw last week, the electric study, these studies are very complex and involve a tremendous amount of data that has to be compiled and analyzed. I would like to recognize the departments for their support time commitment and dedication to this project, IT, engineering, finance, water utilities, and utility and billing services. Dave is here this evening to share the results of the study, to answer any questions you may have, and to discuss a potential path forward. Uh, good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Dave Yonke with New Gen Strategies and Solutions, and I serve as the president of the company. Uh, before we jump into the presentation, just to address that, that concern uh, by the prior gentleman, we're aware of the 1.5 multiplier. Uh, we'll talk about it at the end of the presentation and our recommendations, but we are aware of that. So, Okay. Um, so let's just jump into it. We've got a full agenda here uh, as far as what I'd like to address. Um, first of all, I just want to go through what the purpose of this uh, cost service study is. I'm going to uh, define a couple terms, revenue requirement. We'll talk about the capital improvement plan, excuse me, cost of water, and then water and wastewater rates, and revenue recovery from the proposed uh, rates. And then we'll talk about some bill comparisons and benchmarking. So first of all, let's just jump into the purpose of the analysis. So first of all, uh, the reason new gen was retained, <clears throat> we were asked to develop a 10-year forecast of your operating and capital costs. So you'll see a lot here about the forecast, the capital improvement plan, and some options for funding those at various levels. One of the key items was to develop retail and wholesale and raw water rates that ensure the financial integrity of the utility. So again, I'll be talking about capital project scenarios, and then to do that, you have to have rates that can fund those, those projects. Um, and again, one of the key items we're asked to address was the cost of rural and wholesale cost service. So let's talk about the methodology. Um, the first thing we had to do was develop a revenue requirement, and I'll define that uh, on the next slide. Uh, after you determine what the cost of service is for the 10-year period, we always have to then look and say, are you over or under recovering with your current rates? And if you're under recovering, then what type of rate recommendations uh, will put you in a good position where you can fund all those capital projects? So revenue requirement, it's a very simple term. It's basically covering all of your operating and maintenance costs rolling stock with regard to uh, the equipment like vac trucks and things like that for sewer operations and then your capital improvements um, and so here we're talking about all the needed uh, improvements at the water and wastewater treatment facilities the lines etc and we'll talk more about those so those capital improvement projects they can be funded through what we call pay-as-you-go cash that's generated through rates that then you can pay cash for the projects you don't have to issue debt or, or a combination of both and that's what uh, we're proposing here 
pay as you go and the issuance of debt. So let's talk about the capital improvement plan. Um, <clears throat> there is a large capital improvement plan. I'll call it your CIP. Uh, if you look up at the slide, again, there are a lot of numbers, but if you look in the bottom right corner, it's about $596 million in total, and about 85% of it is water-related, and about 15% is wastewater-related. Okay, so you can see there's a significant amount of capital uh, projects proposed for every year. Can I ask you one quick question? You then? bet. Are these current dollars or are they future dollars? You take into account? Yeah, very good these? question. So these dollars have been inflated at 4% per year. So for, great question. The total projects were estimated uh, in dollars back actually a couple years back at about $425 million. They're then inflated 4% per year to the year it would have, you know, the projects budgeted for. So if you were to do all those projects, it would be $596 million at the time those dollars are spent. Um, I know you've had uh, some of these larger projects uh, mentioned to you. So one of them is the finished water pump station. Uh, the chemicals package at the water treatment plant, backup supply system, and then the CAW raw water line improvement. All those, those are just four of the big ones at $176 million. And then there are additional projects as well. So, check one of my items here. Um, so what we've started with is the test year for the water uh, revenue requirement and so we're starting with the 2024 budget uh, which is the budget that was approved uh, to start July 1 and that's about 10.1 million dollars uh, then there are some adjustments uh, one of the things you do is again fund on a pay-as-you-go basis for the water utility five million dollars a year uh, towards projects again so you can have a mixture of debt financed and pay-as-you-go so you can minimize your interest expense to the greatest extent possible. That grows the net revenue requirement to about $15.5 million. The wastewater, it's a similar approach. We took your 2024 budget, it's about $4.1 million. If you look at the bottom line there, again, you adjust pay as you go about $2.5 million uh, that you, you pay in cash for capital projects here at about $6.7 million. Okay, <clears throat> from my perspective, there are gonna be a lot of numbers today. Um, this is probably, in my opinion, the most important slide to look at. So um, this lays out the two scenarios that we are gonna propose to you. Uh, the first scenario, again, shows that full, and I wanna emphasize this, uh, the total capital funding under scenario one would construct $596 million of capital projects for your water and wastewater systems. And you can see that number up there on the fifth line in bold, total capital funding. Scenario two would fund $525 million of capital projects, okay? Um, if you look up at the, above those lines, uh, lays out the different funding mechanisms. So again, one of the key things over a 10 year period Cash funding, again, this is cash generated through rates, about $118 million of cash, and then the remainder of it, um, less the grants I'll talk about in a second, the, le the rest, the $458 million would be debt funded. So debt funding, $458 million, $118 million in cash uh, can fund the project. Scenario two, uh, $373 million of debt, uh, cash funding, and we did a little more cash, and you'll see when we get into showing you some of the options why we did that, but <clears throat> we increased the pay as you go, and it's $132 million. One thing that's really good for you folks is uh, the city did work um, to get earmarks, federal earmarks, um, and you've got $10 million in grant funds that are gonna to go towards these projects, plus your ARPA funding. 
So uh, almost $19 million in grant monies um, that are available to offset what you've got to fund through cash, pay as you go, and debt service. Real quick, and <clears throat> these are just some numbers for you to keep in your head then. If you were to fund the full $596 million of capital projects over, over 10 years for water and sewer, on average for your average water customer, and we'll go through the average bill, um, it would be an increase on the water side of about 14.2%. On the sewer side, it's about 6%. For the average customer, that's an average bill increase of about 12 to 13 percent, so 12 percent per year for the 10-year period. Scenario two, it would be a 12.7 percent increase on the average water bill. Again, sewer is the same under both scenarios. Okay. So just real quick, there's probably some interest calculation in there somewhere, but Scenario two is showing a smaller average annual increase, but more cash funding. Correct. How's that? <clears throat> well, and I'm glad you're asking questions so we can emphasize these. Bottom line, the reason there's not as big an increase um, for scenario two is your capital funding. If you look at the fifth line, your 525 million in capital versus 596 million under scenario one. So scenario two, lower rates, $70 million less in capital. Again, you go from 596 million to 525. So the cash funding options, cash or debt, doesn't matter as much as the total amount of projects you're doing. So um, about 15% less projects, and you're able to get the, the rate down okay. to 12.7. Thank you. <clears throat> OK. So another thing, just some anecdotal comments I'm going to mention here. You've probably heard over the last few years, being on council, inflation, and the horror stories with capital projects and what they've gone up. You know, that hasn't helped here. That's one of the reasons these numbers have gone up is it costs more to do stuff like this. I'm just gonna give you a couple examples. Uh, we just finished a water, wastewater cost service study for the city of Newcastle, Oklahoma. I was there uh, the first part of September, and just an example that they're dealing with, uh, as that city is growing, they have to improve their wastewater technology. In other words, you can't have some of the open basins for aeration and stuff. So they started looking four or five years ago, and it was going to be about a $20 million wastewater treatment plan because they're planning for growth. Then they started looking at, with inflation and everything, and they said about a year ago when we were working on the study, well, it's probably going to be about $40 million. Okay, so it's double. So you think that's as bad as it can get. Um, so then they opened the bids, which was about a month ago, and that was $52.5 million. So, um, and to give you an idea, put it in perspective, that's $50 million for them. They have 4,000 uh, water customers, about 2,000 sewer customers. Uh, a lot of them, because the bigger lots, are septic. So, sense of magnitude, there, there's an example there. And just, uh, you know, anecdotally, you, you use a lot of steel in these things. Uh, I was dealing with this when I put on my other hat, and I've been before you on solid waste issues. Um, over the last four years, we watched steel go from 20 cents a pound to when Russia invaded Ukraine, it went up to 80 cents a pound. Now it's back down to around 40, 45 cents a pound. So it's down, but it's still up 100% from where it was. So uh, I guess that's good. But uh, bottom line, your costs have all gone up. So <clears throat> um, so let's talk about cost of water also. Um, this was one of the things we're asked to look at. Um, so one of the things we did your retail costs. And again, your retail costs are your residential and commercial customers, okay? Their average cost in FY 2024 is estimated at $8.50 per 1,000 gallons. For the rural systems, 
they're nine to eleven dollars per thousand. And then on the wholesale side, there's a wider range, seven to twelve dollars per thousand. One of the reasons for that uh, wider range on the wholesale customers, you have a couple wholesale customers that take off right by the water treatment plant. So they don't use your transmission and distribution system. So there's a cost they don't incur. So those customers are towards the lower end. Uh, again, their rates are still well below where they need to be for cost recovery, but um, that's why there's a range there. And then on the raw water, about three to four dollars. As you go towards FY 2028, again, there are a lot of capital projects that are budgeted. I showed you that sheet with the uh, $600 million. So looking out at FY 2028, it's projected um, that the retail cost would be $18 per thousand gallons. The rural system would be approximately $22 per thousand. Wholesale, nine to $20, and then the raw, four to five. Um, something I want to mention here, uh, when we started this study, when you do these types of studies, especially a 10-year forecast, you focus on the cost going forward. You, you say, okay, what are we going to spend from a capital standpoint? Who are we spending it on? And then you incorporate that into forecasting your rates. Um, you usually don't look back to say, okay, what has been spent on a typical customer class? So when we started this and I was asked, do you want historical data? I had said, no, we're going to focus on going forward. Um, I'm looking at these and again, doing more research. Uh, I have asked the city to give me some uh, data that with regard to costs incurred historically with regard to the rural system. Again, those are not included here, but those would only you know, make the cost go up more. Those are costs incurred by the city. So we just want to look at it and be thorough. Okay. So um, here are your current water rates. Uh, let me catch up here. So here are your current water rates, uh, your minimum bills, uh, the retail blocks on the side. So for instance, you have an inclining block rate. Um, so you go up there on the top right, you have your wholesale customers rates that are all about three to three dollars and sixty cents per thousand gallons. And then you have your raw water customers around 84 cents. So we've got two scenarios and there are a lot of numbers here. I'm going to focus on a couple numbers. Um, again, this is scenario one. It's up in the top right corner where you can't read it. It says 596 million of capital projects in scenario one. This is the one again where the average water rate increase would be 14.2%, okay? So you can see if you look at the three quarter inch meter up there on the top left, it's $7.45. That's what the average minimum bill is for most residential households. That's probably what you have. You might have a one inch, but most will have three quarter. If you look at what that minimum charge is and where it goes over the next 10 years, just go across to the far right and you see that $28.14. Okay, so that's what it would go to. A um, Couple of things I wanna mention on that. Um, but one key thing I wanna mention is this is a 10 year forecast. What we would recommend is in five years, reevaluate, see where you are. Five years ago, we weren't planning on inflation and it happened. So what's going to happen next? So we would recommend you do a five year true up, uh, regardless of you do it in house, you hire someone else, what have you, but you should do that. Now let's talk about the minimum bill um, going from 745 to 2814. No one's going to like that. Um, but let me give you another couple examples here of what folks are dealing with. Uh, city of Newcastle, their current water minimum charge is $34 per month right now, okay? That was before any rate increases. So they're already, uh, they're beating you. Uh, they're at $34. So there. Um, so that's one example. Uh, Tishomingo, we just finished their water 
and wastewater cost service study, they're at $49 for the minimum charge plus a $5 debt surcharge. We didn't recommend that, um, but it was already in there. So they're basically paying, 50, paying $54 a month before they use any water. So just a couple examples. And then for me personally, uh, I was at a water system down in Austin uh, that's been a long time client of ours. And we were at a water board meeting last Tuesday and I was presenting they voted a 33% increase in their water rates. Their minimum bill is going from $25.15 to $35.15 uh, per month. Again, we're seeing this all over the place um, because of aging infrastructure, having to get um, systems upgraded, water supplies, et cetera, et cetera. Before you move on, yep. um, I just want to make sure that I understand what I'm seeing here. and that. So basically, this particular scenario illustrates quadrupling the base rate over 10 years. And included in those numbers are the capital to do all of our water projects. It's going to be to expand and improve the water treatment plant, do the Lake McMurtry Reserve project, uh, probably some freshening up of the Caw Pipeline. It's everything in there. If yeah. Shelley Crines does a great job and goes out and finds 50 or 100 million dollars in, in grants, we would come back and we would revise these rates down to compensate for the fact we've raised this ex capital that wasn't anticipated when we talked about these rates. Correct. Now, there's the volumetric rate coming also. So this is the monthly, you're, you are correct. Um, these rates, these minimum charges, and then the volumetric rates for scenario one, which I'm gonna show next, would generate the $596 million in mm -hmm. capital. And you're exactly right. That's why when you put something like this in place, you constantly monitor it and you have it. So you're right, if you find additional grant funding. I remember not that long ago when projects came in under bid, you know, then that would lower the cost of the project. So mm -hmm. you are correct. And that's why, you know, the city would constantly monitor this. Okay. Thank you, Dave. So yep. again, just to clarify, this base rate is what a customer will pay if they have one gallon of usage in a month. This is the minimum charge that you pay every month, whether you use water or not, okay. because this allows you to have access to water. And that's one of the things we always talk about, especially as you start issuing debt. Your financial advisors, when you issue debt, they're going to want to see your fixed charges, the minimum bill, fixed charge go up. They don't want everything or a larger percentage coming on your volumetric because that's subject to weather, wet years, dry years. And so we struck a balance with the minimum charge going up and then the volumetric rate going up also. Yeah, this, is, this is for the privilege of being connected. It, it exactly is. At the end of the day, the water system, it has to be paid for for you to use. Um, whether you use 2,000 gallons or 20,000 gallons, the system has to be ready. And in fact, you know, when a new home is built, the city is required to have certain sufficient storage um, with regard to water capacity. And so they have to be ready to plan for the future. Yeah. I own a property in Branson, Missouri, and whether I am there and use water or not, I pay $72.55 a month just to have yeah. the house sitting there. It's, up. yeah. Because they still, you know, we've got clients that, and I heard someone talking here, but, you know, elevated storage tanks where if they had old ones that had lead paint, you've got to get those resurfaced. I mean, it's, you know, over a million dollars to do that. There's all the main, you think taking, you know, I'm a homeowner too. I hate the house bills I get for fixing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it, it pales compared to water systems. So, no, those are good questions there. So moving along, um, this is the other portion. So scenario one, again, the $596 million capital project. So if you look up there, your volumetric rate would go from 745 up um, in fiscal year. And this is very important, it's in my notes. We are recommending a 3%
increase January 1, 2024 for everyone. Retail, your wholesale customers, rural, everyone. And then after that, you know, the increases are up in that, you know, you're going to be averaging that 14%. Okay. So that you can see what those rates are. Again, a couple things I want to mention on here. Well, actually, I'll mention them on the next one when I go to wholesale. Uh, but that's your, your residential uh, inclining blocks. So yes. just to make sure um, I'm clear on that as well. So we would be looking at, so for instance, I'm, I actually have a copy of my bill. <laughs> um, I, so right now I pay $15.08 for the flat rate. So that would go to, over the next 10 years, that would go up to $56.98. Is the okay you have a one inch meter i guess so okay i see fifteen dollars and eight cents on my yeah so, so who okay knew? i had no idea yeah um <laughs> and, but and then in addition to that um i would be paying up to twenty eight dollars and fourteen cents per I, per yeah, thousand per thousand. gallons yep okay for the first and the years. and the blocks the are up there <laughs> so yeah okay. let's take uh let's just take fiscal year 2025 mm -hmm. so if you're there you're you're going to pay your uh minimum uh charge on your one inch mm -hmm. uh would be 1825 and then uh you would be paying nine dollars and one cent per thousand gallons uh for the first fifteen thousand gallons okay. if you look up on that okay. powerpoint you see that That's zero right. to 15 then your next block uh the fifteen thousand one to thirty three thousand gallons uh would go to the 945 okay. etc okay thank you sure yeah I, there's a lot of information here so please feel free to interrupt it i wouldn't be able to remember all my questions um, so let's go that's the volumetric now what I whoops let me go back here we go all right so very important these are the wholesale customers uh, raw water customers and I want to emphasize we have two water scenarios you know the first one's the 596 million the second one's the 526 million sewer is the same for everything okay because they only had 105 million dollars in projects it wasn't that bad we we're able to do it all with a six percent annual increase and then these rates are the same under scenario one or two for your wholesale customers or your raw wa water customers so one of the key things here if you look up here lone chimney in noble county if you look at current they're at 363 and 361 so those are two of your highest wholesale customer rates but they take uh, water from right by the water treatment plant okay so bottom line the cost to serve them versus Payne County and 51 East who go through your transmission and distribution distribution system so they're using your system they use the electricity that's pushing the water they should actually be paying more not less so that's one of the recommendations we have up there is moving those rates up so you can see by FY 2025 uh, Payne County and 51 East are each at 457 Lone Chimney and Noble County uh, are at the four dollars and thirty cents okay um, again couple other anecdotal uh, comments bottom line serving the wholesale customers their rates need to go up they are um, well below the cost of providing the service uh, example again I was at that water system last Tuesday their wholesale rates just to give you an idea in 2021 they were at three and a half dollars per thousand at the beginning of 2025 they will be at five and a quarter so they're going up that that customer those wholesale customer rates are going up 50 percent in about three years okay and let me tell you that's not the end of their rates going up because they need to get more water supplies uh, which are very expensive so um, 
just giving you some examples. And the raw water customers on that page are literally getting untreated water and treating their Correct. own water. Yeah. But they're going to have to share in the costs associated with the call right. uh, line and pumping costs and repairs on the call line, which mm -hmm. there's repairs on the call raw water line. And it's one of the reasons you need some improvements there or redundancy. Again, I'm not an engineer. I'm a finance person. <laughs> So these are the rates, the, the changes for each of these customers is uh, individualized to, to the situation under which they're getting water. Correct. Right. And, and, and it, for the raw water customers, is that percentage lower because they're pulling it earlier in the, in the process? So their rates will be less, but they're going, because they're under recovering, we have them all for the residential just the, in scenario one, mm -hmm. we've got the residential customer bills after, you know, the 3% increase. They're going up about, on the water side, about 17%, and then it goes to 15% in the 10 years. On the uh, wholesale, especially for Payne and 51 East, because we had to get them up, they, the first increase is 30% in 2025, and then it goes to 20%. Lone Chimney and Noble County are about five percentage points less than them because we've got to get Payne County and 51 East, whose cost to serve is more up above. So they're going at a faster rate. And then uh, the raw water goes up at those same percentages. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Scenario two, again, in this scenario, you're only doing $525 million of capital projects. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> I'm going to step back for a second because we're, we're talking about, I mean, these rates are designed, as Councillor Clark said, to uh, allow us to do half a billion dollars in system upgrades, which need to be done. Um, we have a, a wide variety of different types of customers, as this shows, right? We've got our, our residential customers in town. We've got rural customers. We've got the wholesale customers. Is the, is the cost sharing of all of these improvements prorated in some way? Who, are, we, are we saying basically every customer at the retail level is basically sharing the same burden of, yeah. um, of cost for, the, for these big, I mean, because other than the raw water customers, everybody is, is, needs the same amount of upgrade to the system, correct? I mean, that's... Correct. Uh, how we look at that, and it's a really good... I'll keep it high level because I could talk about it a lot longer than you want to listen to it. But one of the things we did at length with, and it was really good, um, Stillwater has on the engineering side very detailed listing of those $425 million of projects. It's like 60 or 70 of them, what have you. And then it grows to 596 with the inflation. So we look at what those are related to. It's related to the raw water line, okay? Well, that hits everybody. Then if you have certain things that are associated with the water treatment plant, well, that doesn't hit the raw water customers. But then we start looking at how the remaining customers use the system. So that's where uh, Loan, let me see. Yeah, Loan Chimney and Noble County they take off right by the water treatment plant. So they shouldn't share in distribution and transmission costs. And so you, you peel those out. So there's general, but then you try to break out where you can. And then one of the key things you do look at is peaking factors. And this is something that is laid out by the American Water Works Association where you look at average monthly load to the peak month that a customer class puts on because the higher the peaking factor, um, the more burden they put on the treatment plant or storage. And some of the wholesale customers have some higher peaking factors. So that gets factored into theirs as well. Okay. So suffice it to say, you didn't just come in and go 12%, 14%. I mean, these numbers are based on an yes. incredible amount of math based on actual costs based on all of that and then what we're seeing here is the result of, of a whole lot of background math that that is correct thank you okay one more thing i want to clarify or, or get an answer sure. to we're back on the base rate structures 
does that include the first thousand gallons of usage or is it 745 and if I use a gallon it's another 745 you have no consumption in there okay none at all yeah if you look up there that thing is like an eye test um, <laughs> so if you look at the three-quarter inch block if you have a three-quarter inch meter tier one zero to five thousand gallons so you're paying that 745 just for the right to be hooked up yeah, well this is the volumetric but well but but oh yeah 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 going but, back to the base but, rate structure let me go back to yeah let me just get here so right base there. rate oh, i'm going the wrong way hold on no you were there that's it that was it go uh, back it was scenario two but yeah that was scenario two i'm uh, gonna go back to scenario one we can use, use current on the so, yeah so, so that's so, 745 for a three-quarter inch meter yes. is zero consumption zero consumption if i use one gallon it's another 745. well it'll be per thousand and then Depending, I'm not going to get into their billing. They probably do it in hundred gallons. Probably prorate it. Yeah, okay. they, but it's and so if you go up to nineteen thousand one hundred on the meter, and then it's thirty thousand five hundred, they mm -hmm. they roll it. But yeah, you, you, you know. Okay. I don't want to say what Dana's job is or how she does it. <laughs> so, but did that answer your question? Right, Councilor Clark. That answer I'm sorry, your what? question. Did that answer your question? You did answer my question, okay, yes. Great. Thank you. No, you bet. All right, so let's go to scenario two. Again, here we're going up. This is only five hundred and twenty five million dollars of capital projects. On the water side, you're going up a little over twelve percent a year. Dave, can you, so scenario two um, included a smaller amount of capital improvement projects? Correct. Can you, I don't know if maybe you are going to explain, but can you explain, we went from 596 to 525, what is not included? So I will turn that over to the city. Okay. I just think as we start talking about that scenario, it'd be good to know yeah. what we're not. You want her to come up afterwards and talk about her now? Up to you. I think as we go through the numbers, I would like to understand what's not included. Okay. Yes. So it's kind of amazing that some of these questions are predicted by some of our team members, Brad. <laughs> So I summarized, I'm going to show you a couple things. First, I want you to know that our CIP that we have is a need-based CIP, Capital Improvement Plan. It has everything on it that we know about, and it goes out for 25 years. And what we provided to Nugen when they asked what was a 10-year look, and for all the things that we hadn't completed in the past five to six years because we didn't have money, you'll see it lined up in the first year. Hmm. So really this is just a, a long list. This is water and wastewater. I'm just gonna scroll through it right now from the top. We can't see it at all. So I <laughs> right. just, all I'm getting yep, is an impressive, there's a lot. Yes. So. And you don't even have to, to know what it says, but I'm just gonna scroll so you'll see this is, everything is showing. All the water and wastewater projects are showing in their groups or it's ordered by time and so this is everything we have on the list for 10 years and this is re pump replacements and lift station refurbishments and heat exchangers and all kinds of things when we have a water plant that has equipment and pumping and lift stations and booster pump stations they all take refurbishment and care um, tractor uh, vehicles and tractors are on here tank and towers, the refurbishment that we do for ground storage tanks. So I get out in here to the very bottom and it's just, that's the 10 years. I could show the rest of this over there. So when you ask the question about what we wouldn't do, I would, because this list is prioritized from what we most need to what we need later, then I would just take this and look up when I hit probably out of that 75 million that we're losing maybe 55 is water so i would you know take off sewer here this is just kind of what i would do and 
go till I get to 55 million. I did that wrong. Sort of kind of in this way where I'm just taking the bottom priorities and not getting to do those and pushing them off until later. And essentially what it means is you're taking on some kind of a risk when we can't do that in the 10 years when it's a pump we couldn't replace or a or a vehicle we couldn't buy or all the different things it is then we don't we don't it's just more risk it's the same way with our call line that we've lived with for many years and we haven't been able to invest anything in it and now our risk is huge because of the problems that we have with the leaks and things this is a way that i summarized that 596 million and there on the left side it's cumulative so there's about 485 in water and about 100 in wastewater. And so we would go through this, this is kind of by categories, and we would take the highest priorities and we do 525 million of the highest priorities and the rest would just get moved till later. So then Dave, is it that in the model as you're looking at providing us options that I don't want to say it was arbitrary because I'm, I'm sure that it wasn't, but certainly you were kind of just looking at the model, trying to figure out where you could affect a less a lesser uh, increase in the rate structure? So what we did there was look at the projects. If you were going to, first off, it's a huge CIP. And so it's, we like to present a couple different scenarios to you to look at. And so there's a lot of this that is a priority. So, I mean, it's like you can't cut it in half and do that so we gave you a scenario where basically we knocked about 15 percent off you know and so um as candy mentioned it's those latter projects then okay we had those planned later years 9 10 we'll push them okay so it really was i mean if you ask me you, you've got to look at from my perspective scenario one but if you're like okay we'll go with scenario two, we'll leave some stuff off. You're still addressing a lot of the stuff on the front end. And so you're not kicking the can down the road, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thank you. Which, and I will just mention, we did put in the back of the uh, packet behind my final discussion slide, there is a third scenario. It's listed as al alternative A, and it's only like 5% increases and if you look at that one it's about 235 240 million of total capital versus the 596 or the 526 million the 232 we did it to show you what five or six percent is and it doesn't address the issue no i mean i think this is all a really important part of the conversation you know as we look at what it caught what it costs us to provide this service and what it costs us to um, maintain this critical infrastructure um, and the kind of pain points that we're feeling right now, um, not having had the opportunity to do that. So I think it's, it's all really important part of the conversation. Sure. Okay. I'm gonna keep. <laughs> That's not my presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. remember what slide you were on. Uh, let's go with uh, 20. Okay, thank you. So let me get, so scenario two we talked about again, it's about 20% less of the projects. Let's get to the wastewater. And so on the wastewater side, there is some good news. You have about $100 million of projects that need to be done but with 6% annual increases over 10 years, that's doable. And honestly, because you cannot have any subsidy um, between the two utilities. So you said that's doable, doable without debt. No, you'll need debt. Doable with debt. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's going to be pay as you go and debt service because you have about $105 million worth of projects. But you know, five six percent when inflation a year ago was nine percent to me is a really that's that's a good story. Okay, so these are your current wastewater rates. Again, uh, your wastewater. There's only one scenario. 
um, because we didn't have to do the different what ifs of hey only doing 80 percent of it like the water so here your current minimum charge is eight dollars and eighty cents that would grow to 14.89 so most folks that's what your minimum charge will be for being connected to the system again a good example right now <clears throat> newcastle uh, their current minimum charge is $16. It will be going to $28 by 2028 with the new plant. So um, looks like they beat you again. So, yeah. So uh, on the volumetric side, honestly, you're at $357 going to $6. Uh, we have clients in Texas where the wholesale treatment of service like North Texas Municipal Water District's a huge regional wastewater provider. Cities connect and all their wastewater goes to them for treatment. The wholesale rate is $9 a thousand. That's just, that doesn't take any of the cost of running the collection system within the city. And yours only goes to $6. Again, an example, Newcastle's rate was $1.50 uh, right now, which is incredibly low, but that was due to the type of technology. It's just aeration. Um, they're going to be at six and a half dollars by 2028 on a per thousand basis. So, um, again, um, so let's talk. And again, a lot of numbers. I apologize. The key thing I just want to focus on is, and again, this is scenario one 596 million dollars of capital projects. If you can read it, um, the third line over under as you go across you get to where you have the over recoveries that are about three to four million dollars in 2032 and 2033 if you're asking why do you have that much over recovery one of the reasons this is the scenario and we'll talk about it that has more debt for the water system you have to maintain a 1.25 times coverage requirement and i won't get into all of it except means you have to keep some extra cash because otherwise your financial advisors will be very nervous about you having all this debt and not a little margin for again wet weather you don't sell as much water you want to have some some margin the the sewer is real good on the second from bottom on all the way over on the second from bottom line over recovery of 234 grand and then on scenario two if you look again on that third line there's only the over recovery of a million two sixty three and that is because we did more pay as you go instead of debt service so by doing more pay as you go and increasing the cash we didn't have to issue as much debt in that scenario okay Let me catch I, I appreciate the fact that these are I mean, these are all long-term projects. These we've, we've got to be looking at 10-year, at least, windows here. But, I mean, it's hard to believe there's a whole lot of accuracy looking at these numbers 10 years out. I mean, costs, uh, you know, something breaks we didn't plan to break. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's a good exercise to say this is why we would put rates where we're putting them. But I don't know. If, I mean, how much... What's the margin of error on these kinds of numbers for a project like this? So from my standpoint, and again, everyone's system, and I'll let Candy chime in if she likes, what we have seen on these, uh, when we do these, you've got a very detailed capital plan, and you're guaranteed the cost, something's going to happen over 10 years you didn't budget for, because that's just how it is. Oil goes up or steel prices go down, what have you. From my perspective, what I always do, what I, the way I look at it, there are key projects like those four we talked about. I showed they're mm -hmm. like 176 million. You know those have to happen. They're already moving. So boom, that's like a third of your capital. So you know that's going to happen. And then I bet probably another 40, 50% of those things are going to happen. So that's 80, 85%. But something happens you know a lift station failure and all of a sudden you're spending one and a half million dollars and you're like well i didn't plan on that um but you're moving the rates in the right direction and that's the key thing you've got to move the rate increases 
so you're funding these projects or the other things that come up that you didn't plan on because your crystal ball didn't go that far yeah. out and you just you said something that jogged my mind but this these numbers include projected growth overall in the system New, we have meters and yeah we do and we have conservative growth because what you don't want to do is say we're going to grow at five percent a year and then it doesn't happen and then you're under recovering okay. if something grows quicker then again that's why you're always going back mm -hmm. and visiting it and that's why you do the five-year checkup let's say something happens you have a three 500 home development that comes in in the next seven years because there's some major uh you know we've seen that uh happen we had a client in new mexico that got a i don't know how the citizens would feel they got a horse track for gambling and they got a prison so it created <laughs> uh, a lot of new homes um, not sure it was the client base they wanted but um you know so those things can change things but um that's why you look at a five-year checkup because if let's say something happens you can always go you know what when we had it tailing at 15 percent increases 12 and a half hey now we only have to do five percent let's say that's why you do the checkup halfway through thank you no that's those are those are good questions to ask all right i'm going to hit just the because it's gone a little longer i'm going to hit just the i done a couple examples of the average bill for a water customer at 6400 gallons of water and 4500 gallons of sewer that kind of represents your average customer there's another example with 10,000 gallons and I'm just gonna skip through it's the same trend but on this what you can see and this is where most of your residential customers would be um, except for counselor Hawkins who has a one-inch meter so <laughs> okay all right well thank you um so your average bill would be eighty dollars and fifty cents right now with the three percent increase it goes to 82.90 and then you can see the bills for the next four years go up on average about 14 percent a year and you can see less of the increases on the wastewater side again i'm going to skip through the ten thousand on the scenario two again uh just look at the bottom line instead of being around 14 percent for the annual increase you're running around 12 12 and a half percent so again about a one and a half percent difference there okay and then ten thousand okay benchmarking so let's take a little time and look at the benchmarking let me get there so again we'll focus on the 6400 gallons 4500 gallon scenario so the first three columns um, the first one is your current bill so again the first one total monthly bill eighty dollars fifty cents under scenario one January 1st it would go to eighty two ninety in scenario two it still stays at 8290 because everybody was going to go up three percent um, but then here are the ones you benchmark against and you can see you're pretty comparable even with that first increase granted it's only three percent um, but you're pretty comparable with uh, Bartlesville Broken Arrow uh, Edmonds above you and uh, you can see where the other folks uh, come in something I want to mention here comparing water systems and what folks are doing it's always hard to compare apples to apples if someone's on groundwater versus surface if you're on groundwater groundwater is cheaper to treat than surface water do you have a large industrial base that is subsidizing or is it primarily a residential commercial wholesale which a lot of cities that's how they are um, but this is a proactive approach i can guarantee you these other cities up here um they are their rates will be going up over the next 10 years they will have capital projects either for um, repairs adding capacity or trying to get additional water that's one good thing i was checking on uh 
talking with Bill about it, you have a huge abundance of raw water, which is really good. Um, again, I've got a client that they're having to, in Central Texas, they are having to buy additional water for growth. And we did a study for them over a 30 year cycle. They have two options. And this is in dollars, not net present value, but over the 30 year period, the two scenarios are they would spend three to $400 million for additional water. So um, you're, you're very fortunate you've got a raw water supply, but now you've got to maintain the system. My last slide. Hey, that's me. <laughs> um, in closing, so what I would recommend, next steps, uh, imp imp okay, um, so next steps, uh, we would recommend January 1st implementing the 3% increase on your retail, wholesale, and raw water, and that's what we've shown. Uh, we would then recommend implementing the annual rate increases at July 1 for whichever of those two scenarios you went with, okay? Um, we would recommend implementing the one and a half times multiplier. I wanna be clear, we have not incorporated that in to these rates, so that is not in here. Uh, my understanding, uh, there are there's a legal document, uh, I'm, it's a policy issue, so all I'm doing is giving you my recommendation of what we see in the industry. Um, there's a significant amount of money that's gonna be expended on them to the benefit of the rural system. Uh, it makes sense to consider that. There's a higher peaking factor on some of them that makes sense to consider it. Um, it's pretty typical in the industry that there's a multiplier that oftentimes is put on rural systems or outside uh, city customers. You do that on the sewer system. You already do one and a half times, so you have a precedent for it. But um, again, that's, that's my two cents there. Um, let's see, what else? I think that's everything I wanted to focus on, um, and I appreciate the questions along the way. Any other additional questions or comments? Okay, so I, I do. Um, as far as timing, we're, we're looking at $600 million that we've got to spend over 10 years. What kind of timing would you recommend? I mean, do we do $150 million worth of bonds right now? I mean, how, how do you time all this to make it work? So, um, Candy already, they have a plan laid out. And so I would use that plan. Um, and I think you've got project managers. You know, this is a question for you. <laughs> I do like Gantt charts. So we wouldn't do bonds. I think we would take out loans and we would heavily rely on the SRF program. And we've talked about WIFI in the past and we've never been convinced because they have a higher application and a matching, a local 50% matching that's required, but they have the ability to loan us that kind of money to hit all these years of expenses. For SRFs, I've, uh, I used to be with SRF. I was there for a year and a half and I recall the t point in time when Broken Arrow had a huge water plant to build and they funded only their plant that year and no one else was able to receive funding. And so I know they've done that at least at one point to give us some pretty big numbers. Okay, enlighten me on SRF. That's an Sorry, state revolving know. fund. So there's Thank a our state revolving fund they fund on both the clean water and the drinking water side and it's money that comes down from the feds and then it takes care of itself as the interest comes back then it kind of revolves, I guess. Does that help? It is a monumental task for sure. And when we look at that money and think about the staff we've had in the past and how much work we've been able to do, we've uh, kind of nickel and dimed ourselves because we know that's the money we have and we don't have any more money to spend. And so to think about us changing the way we plan and program, that kind of 
work. It would be much larger projects, big programs where on the one document where I was pointing out, like for example, this 300,000 linear feet of water line, which is what's on the 10 year forecast, that's 56 miles. So we'd hire groups to spread that out over 10 years and we'd work with Christy on the loan programs and we'd, it'd be a pretty big planning effort, but we can do amazing things. And Christy's queued oh. up. I just wanted to point out that under the SUA trust indenture, we do have a debt limit um, without going to a vote of our citizens of 40% of prior year's revenues. Um, and so that was taken into account and considered during this rate study. And then as Dave already mentioned, we do have to adhere to our debt service coverage ratio of 1.25 times. And that is, it's not only in an, our internal debt policy, but that is more importantly in our bond indenture for our, uh, the bonds, the revenue bonds that funded the Ener energy center. So what is that 40% number? <laughs> what does that come up to about? Um, it's roughly about forty million dollars. So we're still a hundred million dollars short on the on the main stuff then. Yes. Okay. What is our water rate history? This is maybe a question for Dana, but what 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 have our water rate increases changes look like over the last ten years as compared to what these would look like? And other than like the automatic, have we done? Have we used the automatic? We have escalator on the water side. Yes, I believe in. I want to say the resolution that was passed in 2015 for water rates added the automatic escalator in the absence of some other rate increase. Um, I don't. Re I don't remember the rate increases approved prior, um, but I know they weren't at this level. I know that. Well, we, we, yeah, we haven't had a, a an escalating rate over the last 10 years, other than that. 3% CPI. We adjustment. had um, 2015, there was a resolution. I believe it was a multi year rate increase. Three year plan. Three year plan. And prior to that, it was 2009 with, again, I think it was a multi year rate increase and it was twice a year, every January and July. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To that question um, on the debt, that that was one of the things that uh, Christy worked with myself and Steph, uh, our consultant, and Steph did a great job on modeling it because we had to see how much debt we could issue each year. So we had to look at all three utilities, electric, water, wastewater, and see what would be available. So you could do that each year, but that number is driven by and has a cap there's the 40% cap and a coverage. So that's how we, pl that was part of how the projects were planned. It's like, there's only so much you can do because mm -hmm. you can't violate your debt covenants, yep. but it still gets you a lot of money um, to get the stuff done. Well, I think this is a, um, I mean, this is a community conversation around what is it cost us to have clean drinking water delivered to our homes? I mean, I, I, you know, it's not a, us trying to make this decision necessarily or, or or you know community trying to decide if they should give us money to be able to do these projects this is a very much a we have a community that that uses drinking water and we've got to figure out a way to continue to provide it um it, it's a i mean this is, these are shockingly high rate increases to be honest i mean for, for most people looking at this would would go you're talking about quadrupling my water bill over the next four years or in 10 years, ten years. Um, and, and I I mean I I would feel the same way like you said we all pay water bills uh, we all pay bills and it's it's um, it, but I think uh, there's also a, a ton of information here about why these rates are being uh, discussed at this point and and those that capital improvement plan uh, we've been talking for a year or more at least about uh, the needed upgrades to, to water uh, you know we've been looking at grants we've been you know i've been to visit with our senators and we, we've you know been trying to find money from every source and we'll continue to do that uh, but half a billion dollars in infrastructure improvements over 10 years uh, that money doesn't 
come from anywhere else other than us collecting revenue or, or finding a grant or, or doing those things. So I think you're right that we need to continue to do all that. But it is, um, I mean, a, a, again, a community discussion about what's it going to cost for us to continue to have clean water coming out of the, the, the faucets in our house. I think that's a really important, important point, Mayor, that there's kind of a multifaceted approach, whether it's the you know, rate increases in the debt, um, incurring debt to get those things done, but also the grants. But I think it's important to realize with those, the, the number of zeros that we have after the projects that we're looking at, while we've been successful with maybe $20 million with ARPA and the other funds, taking extremely large bites out of that really, really big number is going to be challenging. And as you've kind of shared with us, there's a lot, and, and actually Senator Langford shared with us, there's communities all over the state that are struggling with water issues. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be competing against those communities, and some of those communities are struggling not just with the infrastructure, but the actual water supply itself. Mm -hmm. And so, um, while I'm hopeful and we'll do everything that, I, you know, I'm sure all of us will do everything we can to bring grant funding to Stillwater to help, I just don't, I think it, we don't want to create a false sense of hope that yeah. that's going to, you know, take this ginormous bite out of those big, big dollars. Councilors, um, any further questions for Dave specifically about the, the study itself? Um, tons of information, <laughs> tons of work uh, into that, and and uh, very much appreciated from from our side and uh, you and your team. Of uh, that's that's a, a task in and of itself, just to put all those those numbers together and find viable solutions for us. We we appreciate the work and the presentation. Thank you. I, I would like to say to to city manager that I would like to understand our contractual obligations. For example, the Rural Water District, what does it say? What are we bound to? Um, and there may be other customers that have contracts with obligations. I'd like to understand all of those so as before we get to a vote and, and yeah. make sure that we're voting legally. Uh, the other thing is, is that when we get to the point of uh, voting, I would like to understand what the communication plan is, not just within the city and our core water system, but all these other outside the, the the rural district 51 and, and all those those entities what's our communication plan to them so they don't get blindsided by this if they're not paying attention to the store news press or whatever they're watching to keep track of us so I would just make a, a comment to that point um, actually to the point of, of grant funding and going out and, and trying to mm -hmm. find programs for this today was actually the first meeting we had with FEMA's uh, technical assistance program mm -hmm. which is a competitive program that we were selected to uh, one of 20 some, I don't know, not a handful of, of communities in the country uh, to do that. And actually, one of the things we talked about was outreach, talking to our customers, all the folks who share in this mm -hmm. water system. So, that actually, that part of that plan will, will actually have some outside help to make sure that we're having those conversations. Perfect. Those are actually going to get kicked off here pretty quick. So, you know, we, we have been able to hope, hopefully find some of that um, assistance to kind of get us to, because you're right, I mean, I, I think. We have a lot of partners. We talk about this being a regional water system, and mm -hmm. it is. Um, you know, 50,000 residents in Stillwater, but 80,000 or so people that actually depend on on our water supply and more that would like to. Mm -hmm. um, the cities in Cushing and Perkins would, would actually love to be on our water system because they don't have anywhere anything near as, as reliable as ours is. Um, so uh, we, we do need to have those conversations. We are working out and, and figuring out to make sure that those folks understand, hey, this is it's great we love having you as customer and as a partner but we're all gonna have to share in in how mm -hmm. this is how this gets funded so. and the more customers we have the more questions we have to spread yes. this capital cost or two and I appreciate you bringing that up too because um, Dave mentioned so to, to, to mr. Sitton's point in public comment we do have the way these numbers are are in this report it is on the assumption that rural water customers that we own are paying the same rates as city customers you made a recommendation that perhaps those rates need to be higher, uh, but that's a whole other discussion for another day. Um, so, I, and I appreciate you making that point. So, without even though the language is not in here, this study is based on the fact that that contract, um, you know, is in place. Yeah. So, and, and and on that note, to 
Bill's prepared. He brought a bunch of information tonight mm -hmm. to share, but because of the time length of the meeting, I'll take all those recommendations you have for us and bring that back and be part of our communication piece as we discuss rates moving forward. Are you good with that, Bill? <laughs> yeah. So he had, he did have all those contracts and all those documents okay, compiled perfect. for us for tonight in case it came up. So good. just as Thank a reminder, you. we're going to have um, town halls on this, the 10th and the 12th, for people to give comment. And then what what's the what's the schedule for actually considering resolutions? I think we're talking early November is when we'd be looking at the correct. We we had bookmarked the first meeting in November to bring back the rate resolutions after we've uh, had the town hall meetings and on the six, the October sixteenth meeting we were bringing to you publicly at a council meeting examples of bills with all the rates okay. combined. Can you share a little bit more about what the town hall format will be? So should people expect that they're receiving information from us and getting an opportunity to provide feedback or is it just us providing information or what yep. What should people come expecting? So what we've, we've asked the consultants for both of those evenings to have a more simplified um, presentation that's shorter and um, more easily consumed and then we will uh, and ha allow time, you know, the second half of the time to answer any questions, to hear feedback. Um, so it'll be a presentation from the consultants and then questions and answers with staff and counselors that are present. And I'm assuming we'll have a chance to sign up and say we'd like to go to one of those because we can't have a quorum yep. there, obviously, yep. right? Yep. So, yep. okay. Okay, counselors, further questions about that item? at this point at least again thanks uh, to, to staff um, certainly work, working with uh, uh, the consulting teams on both of these studies uh, this is a lot of work and a lot of um, difficult decisions and complex uh, factors to take into consideration and um, we appreciate the fact that you're bringing back uh, information for us that that um, you know takes into account what we need to do for the long-term health of our community and uh, it is is going to be a discussion here for the next several weeks for sure. So we appreciate that work. Item 5B on the agenda is consider awarding a bid for the LED light fixtures to Stuart C. Irby Company, authorizing a budget amendment uh, and authorizing the general manager to execute the documents. Mr. Smith, tell us more about this item. Good, e <clears throat> Good evening, trustees. Excited to be here to uh, elaborate a little more on Mr. Moore's comments uh, in the previous meeting. Um, the city of Stillwater has an outdated fleet of non-energy efficient streetlights that are in need of replacement to achieve energy conservation goals. There are approximately 4,400 streetlights throughout the city. On August 21st, the council requested the staff return with an implementation plan to replace existing streetlight fleet with energy efficient LED streetlights. Since then, staff has worked to create a plan and has taken steps to move forward. The plan includes releasing a bid to procure approximately half of the streetlights in FY24 and release another bid in FY25 to procure the other half in preparation for, ins for installation using distribution staff or in-house staff. Staff estimates two years to full rollout once they receive the light fixtures. Specifications and bid documents were prepared by staff and released on September 2nd. On September 20th, two bids were received and opened. The bids were evaluated and are tabulated in the attached bid tabulation. Stewart C. Irby Company met all the bid specifications, making them the lowest responsibility. And the shocking part is that the estimated delivery is 28 to 56 days. Wow. So when I read that, I thought weeks. Well, that sounds about right. And I went back, that says days. So uh, literally in about uh, 40 or 50 days, we could have 120 pallets of lights show up and uh, our crews will immediately start uh, deploying those i have a motion here but i will pause to answer any questions i know you had a, a mr <laughs> a trustee harden you had a question about uh, labor again this is going to be done by our own in-house experts uh you know uh, we estimate that cost to be about 1.3 million dollars which uh is something that we would have to pay a, a contractor quite frankly that we're not going to have to because of our uh, ability to do that in-house but it is an opportunity cost. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lauren, in the report it says costs are approximately 1.6 million. Is that 
for all of the all fixtures the fixtures for two, for both years. Yes, sir. And then so then this year is the eight hundred thousand. Yeah. That's the first part of it. Okay. And we anticipate next. Uh, it, it's a couple of things. It's it, it softens the impact on our capital budget, and uh, we don't have a place to store one hundred and twenty pallets of lights. So <laughs> we're it's going to a burden that uh, take that burden off of us as well. So we can start deploying them and then bring them on. So. Councilors, questions? And Sorry, this trustee. Be, oh, this wait, will be all the street lights. So if it's right. tough back in a neighborhood, we're going to yes, sir. change it out. Yes, sir. That's a good question. So, sorry, Go ahead. maybe I was remembering wrong. <laughs> There's been a lot of numbers tonight. Yeah. Um, I was just remembering from the city council meeting tonight that I thought the number allocated for the lights was five hundred thousand. That's for municipal buildings. Uh, it, it, it did not include street lights. That okay. was just for uh, our municipal buildings. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Certainly a difference there. Yeah, these are all the roadway street lights. Gotcha. So in addition to the chiller and the municipal building, this is another piece of the um, energy savings program that we're working on. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. That's so right. about $2 million That's altogether great. between the three mm -hmm. projects. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Just curiously, what color are these lights going to be? I mean, are they going to be the the orange lights or they're they're about 300 they're about 3,000 K and that doesn't mean a lot and I didn't know a whole lot about it until we did our, our study but uh, we considered several options and that one was uh, thought to be you know it's not too bright it's not too soft uh, we're confident that we're going to have uh, complaints they're going to be a totally you know they're probably going to be <laughs> a lot different uh, but that's the beauty of us doing it in house because we can go back and take time without a change order or something and really work with the customer and shield and do things to help but this will be a wider light than some of the amber orange ones we yes. see around town. Yeah, those high pressure sodium, the orange kind of glow on mm -hmm. that will go away. So it will it'll certainly, and the nice thing, it'll be consistent across the city, right? Because you don't look through the city and see all the different color right. lights. So we're, we're excited. We've been wanting to do this for about three years. So we, you ask, we deliver. We're going to pull the trigger on this thing. Go with us. <laughs> Love to see it. What is your recommendation for us, Lauren? Uh, I have a motion to award the bid for the LED light fixtures to two Stewart C. Irby Company, approved budget amendment, appropriating expenditures up to $894,242. That includes a contingency from the rate stabilization fund and authorize the interim general manager to execute contract documents in the amount of $812,948. Trustees. I move to approve the staff recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. Please vote. And Thank I can approve with a vote of five zero. Thank you, Lauren. Any reports from the officers of the board? Mm -hmm. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn SUA. Please vote. With a vote of five to zero, the Storey Utilities Authority is now adjourned, and that concludes our meetings for the evening.